Hi everyone, uh, it's Adrian Warnock here again, wearing my red t-shirt for um, Blood Cancer Awareness Month. Um, this is September and uh, as part of the month, I'm trying to do a few more interviews with people. I'd like to introduce you today to a good friend of mine, actually, Jenny. Um, Jenny, why don't you tell everyone how we met to start with? Hi Adrian, thank you. Um, so Adrian and I met on the SHINE breakout course, which is run by SHINE Cancer Support. Um, I think Elle mentioned this in her recent interview as well. Um, it's a really great kind of peer-to-peer -peer networking group, which um, is, is SHINE's online answer to how to link cancer patients up with each other. They specifically work with um, people who are in their 20s, 30s and 40s who've had a cancer diagnosis. And yeah, we did six weeks, I think, of Zoom calls together, just kind of working through loads of the kind of common stuff that comes up after a cancer diagnosis and, you know, talking to other people who, who understand um, all the many, many multifaceted things that that experience brings up, which was, was really great. And um, yeah, here I am still talking to you so yes so it must have been all right we we, we became friends i think it's fair to say so, yeah, indeed. um with the other people in the group as well and we, we still have a, a bit of you know every now and then we'll meet up and chat as well don't we on, on the zoom thing which is yeah. which is really lovely the weird thing is that we've never actually met any of us face to face so um that, oh. that may change at some point but it's been a weird thing for a lot of us and that i think comes up with your story as well but the other thing that's maybe just worth sort of mentioning right at the beginning here was that i think for all of us and even for the course um, it was designed for people, I think, who'd actually gone through the, the cancer journey and we, we'd all uh, not necessarily finished, but we'd all certainly completed, you know, courses of treatment and things. Um, and I think for a lot of people, that's the moment where a lot of the people around sort of think, oh, well, you must be all right now. You know, you've got the all clear or whatever the words are, you ring the bell and all that kind of stuff. And I know for me personally, that was a really difficult time. And um, and I guess there's a recognition that that's often a difficult time um, in, the, in the Shine people, and that's why they, they bring people together in that context. So I don't know if you want to sort of reflect a little bit on that before we then reverse, if you like, and get to the beginning of the story. But would, would you agree that it was quite difficult for you at that moment when you get the all clear and everyone assumes you're going to be all right? Or... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I did, the, I did that course where we met. Um, I was about nine months post my stem cell transplant which I think given given the treatment that I had it's not really clear where the end of treatment is I mean even now I'm still on a um, a protein inhibitor which I'll be on for another six months or so until I'm two years post transplant so I've never even seen a bell in the haematology unit that I go to. I didn't have if, one at my, my place. No but if, but if there is one then I guess maybe I could ring it in another six months or maybe I should have rung it a while ago it's very unclear to me where treatment actually ends yeah. um and it's yeah it's absolutely true what you said that um you know no matter how kind of supportive everybody is around you you do have a kind of feeling of being a little bit lost when the kind of most intense part of your treatment has finished and when you know everyone knows that you're in treatment and is checking in with you to see how that's going um I think for me, one of my reasons to join for joining that course, and I said it during the course, was that I just I needed to carry on talking about it, but I didn't really want to bore my friends and family. And, and I wanted to have normal conversations with them. I wanted to go back to talking about some of the things we used to talk about. So I needed a space that was for just talking about all this rubbish that mm. my cancer had brought with it and all the aftermath of it. And it was really great to know that that space was specifically set up to do that and that I wasn't going to be boring anybody in there. And that I might actually be helping other people by, you yeah. know, us all talking together. And that's still really valuable. I still yeah, really value that in, in that group of friends that yeah. I can go to you guys. And, just, you know, that's a really great outlet for doing that, which I gather I'll probably always need. That kind yeah of I, we have a little whatsapp group don't we and, and we chat to each other sometimes and like you know if something comes up like for one person it was oh I've got a job interview and it's all a bit different isn't it when you've got a job interview with a blood cancer diagnosis in the background they're like do I tell them what do I say what's it going to be like can I work full-time you know all of that kind of stuff and and it was quite interesting because like I remember that particular time someone said that and there's only like four or five of us in the group isn't there something like that mm -hmm. um and they sent that message and I'm not sure they thought we'd all sort of necessarily 
understand but we all came back with like yes 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 you know and it was like kind of there's that commonality of the experience although obviously everyone's experience is different too and yeah. So I think yeah you're absolutely right and for anyone watching who you know who who wants to join a group like that that's that's a great opportunity but there are other things too and obviously there are these Facebook groups that can be quite useful as well although it's maybe not quite as personal when you're just texting not not talking to people but I'm a great believer in Zoom and so we have a a weekly Zoom call as well that's part of the blood cancer uncensored sort of family um and, and Jenny's one of our authors so hopefully she'll come along to some of those calls as well and people can sort of ask you questions and chat with you there and, and it's a lovely opportunity and not everyone comes every week um I go most weeks and uh, just a small number of us but it's it's kind of like a family uh, and so you know warm welcome to anyone who wants to that, make that connection and if it's not with us then it's with another group as well you have to find uh, an opportunity that works for you where you can talk with other people who, who get it and understand and so you know Jenny has a blood cancer I have a blood cancer very different in some ways our stories um but obviously some commonality and so that that gives an understanding so let's just now go into sort of reverse mode for a minute because obviously you didn't always have a blood cancer so talk to us a little bit about you know what was going on for you uh what your life was like before you had that that d-day as it were sure um so D-Day for me was in uh, two years ago, September 2019. And prior to that, I was very kind of active, normal, I guess, whatever that means, normal, 33-year-old, um, very busy working, kind of freelancing in the arts in London, um, whizzing around all over the place most of the time. Quite, um, I guess I always thought of myself as healthy I had I'd, I'd suffered with migraines for most of my adult life which made me feel like I had to sort of manage my activity levels um and always make sure I got enough sleep and that kind of thing and I spent lots of time trying to work out how to beat the migraine but you know I knew that it had no kind of sinister underlying cause I was essentially very healthy and then my diagnosis came after feeling unwell I felt unwell for about a month prior to my diagnosis but in retrospect I had had some other symptoms earlier than that maybe a couple of months before the diagnosis um, I had quite a lot of back pain which I explained away I'd been camping so I thought it was because of that I'd spent a lot of time in a car which was quite unusual for me so I blamed that um, I had also I'd gone to the dentist. I had a strange experience at the dentist where having for my whole life always been told that I had very healthy teeth and clearly looked after them very well. I went to a dentist and was told that I had borderline gum disease from hmm. poor dental hygiene. And I just believed them and thought, oh, well, I haven't been brushing my teeth well enough. And they told me to get an electric toothbrush, which I did. And it made my gums bleed. And they said that was normal. Um, and then a few weeks after that, I started to feel unwell. Um, I came down with a very sore throat, just really kind of overwhelming fatigue. Um, amazingly, now looking back on it, I managed to just keep plowing on with all of my work. But I stopped doing all the other things because I would get to the end of a working day and just be completely wiped. And mm. I cancelled weekend plans. Um, that's and... interesting. Yeah, that, that, that's interesting because that was something that happened with me um, yeah. months because mine was a bit more slow moving than yours. yours. Um, but months before I, I did get sick and, and got my diagnosis, I, I just stopped doing stuff. I, yeah. I just stopped seeing friends. I just used to go to bed a lot earlier stopped a lot of my hobbies I used to do a lot of writing stopped doing all of that so I guess it was a bit like that for you mm. sort of slowing down feeling yeah but still really pushing myself to not let people down so anything that I was committed to work-wise mm. you know I just wanted to keep doing and 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 continually explaining away these symptoms by you know oh it was a bad a bad posture or bad dental hygiene or then with the with the sort of viral symptoms I was getting it was this kind of time of year actually September time I was you know trying to get back into work after a bit of a more relaxed summer and kind of thinking oh I'm being so pathetic I can't get up in the mornings anymore just after having a few weeks off work um you know really kind of beating myself up about not coping with 
the demands of everyday life. Mm. Um, but I would say the one big blessing in all of it was that after feeling unwell for a couple of weeks, I did go to the GP because I was so fed up of it and I felt like I wasn't getting better. Um, and I was initially told to leave it a bit longer because all my symptoms pointed to a virus. And, you know, we're, as we're always told, you, you, you can't do anything for a virus. You can't, antibiotics won't work. So you just leave it and it will get better on its own if you're generally fit and healthy, which I was as far as everybody knew. Um, so, yeah, so I went away and during that next kind of 10, 10 days to two weeks, I had some more really, really serious back pain, like to the point where I couldn't move my head and my neck. And yet as I was still doing stuff. I actually went to a choir rehearsal where I laid on the floor because I couldn't stand up to sing because it hurt too much, but I still wanted to be Sorry, there. I shouldn't be laughing. Really. No, but it's, it's funny. It's like, you know, I was like, I can't stop doing stuff because, because that's, you know, that'll be sort of defeatist. I'll be letting this sort of vulnerability get on top of me. And I like, yeah, I was literally lying on the floor because I was in so much pain. I did at that stage, I made another doctor's appointment. I was like, this is, this is not right. This is ridiculous. I, you know, I need, I need a further investigation. Um, second time I went to the GP, um, uh, they, she ordered a blood test, which was exactly the right thing to do. Interestingly, she ordered that off the back of my kind of viral symptoms, thinking maybe I had glandular fever. That was the query on the blood test. And, and she actually said, um, I haven't really got time to talk to you about all your other problems. You'll have to make another appointment. But luckily she had to order the blood test, which was the thing that was really needed so because that suddenly explained count. everything. It was a full blood count, wasn't it? Um, it must have been a full blood yeah. count. At the time, I didn't know. I, I thought, oh, if they're only testing me for... I didn't know anything about blood tests, really, two mm. years ago. I know a lot now. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> if I thought if they're only testing me for glandular fever, they what if it's something else? You know, they won't pick up anything else. And I was not expecting them to ring and say, you know, we've actually spotted something really obvious in your blood. But they had. didn't you have a, like, literally come to the hospital now type of phone call, was it? Was that yeah, right? so it was a Friday night. Uh, my husband and I had had dinner. I actually missed a phone, missed a call because we were eating and I didn't have my phone on me. And then we sat down. We were halfway through the very last episode of Stranger Things, which has sadly been ruined for me forever. Um, and uh, yeah, the phone rang and it was the it was the haematology lab at Guy's Hospital where my blood samples had been sent. And they said, you need to go to A&E. And they gave me some numbers to write down um and like of my cell counts and I didn't know what those numbers meant and I, I never kept a record of them so I can't look at them now and sort of wonder about you yeah. know what message that was giving to anyone who would read that but we went straight to A&E and we handed in the numbers at the desk and actually they were expecting us because the lab had phoned and said you know this person's coming in um and yeah I was I was I was diagnosed or told in A&E that night of their suspicion of what that blood test showed. They took another blood test. Um, and then I had a, I had a biopsy in like, Oh, like two o'clock in the morning or something horrendous. Did you have a lump then as well at this point? No, I, no, I didn't have, I didn't have any lumps. They just, they looked at my uh, blood samples and said, and told me that it looked like a leukemia. Um, and they took a, a bone marrow biopsy from my hip oh, in I the see. night. In the yeah. middle of the night, wow. Yeah, yeah literally, they, it was Friday night and they said they just needed, they wanted the sample as quickly as they possibly could. Yeah. Um, so they took that biopsy. Yeah, the, it was the on-call haematologist who literally came in the middle of the night. You know, I, I'd been put into sort of the nearest available bed. Mm. Um, and... Yeah, it was, I mean, because of the time, because it was a Friday night and then obviously it was only weekend cover on the hospitals and the doctors, it was my actual full confirmation of diagnosis sort of, it was sort of almost drip fed to me, nobody's fault, but that's just how it was because, you know, it was sort of an on-call haematologist who came back and saw me in the morning and said, I've looked at this sample, it, you know, it does look like leukaemia. And then obviously... They didn't say what I saw, type or, or did they at that point? Um, so I... 
not at that very, very beginning point. I mean, it wouldn't have meant anything to me if they had anyway. At some point in the next few days, a, a consultant of some sort obviously had a look and, and was able to be a bit more um, kind of specific. Um, and they told me that it looked like um, myeloid leukemia. And then I can't remember whether I had another biopsy or whether I think it just took a few days for the most detailed lab reports to mm, come back yeah. um they have because, to they have to like kind of stain the cells and yeah so uh, so I was so I was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia and within a few days you know very luckily I was I'm at at guys they've got these fantastic labs where they do all of the genetics and everything on it so that didn't take too long um so you know within a week they had sort of told me all the genetic mutations and again all this stuff that would have meant nothing to me like literally a few days before then but the level of detail you know is is amazing and they sort of give you a diagnosis but then a few days later they're like and it's this type of it and it's this type and it's this type and you know yeah. right down to like the the chromosomes which is just yeah amazing and, and terrifying no it is and of course um for people watching you know with blood cancer it it you know, it's a huge issue. I, I mean, even I was shocked to realise that the statistics now say that one in 19 people in the UK will develop some form of blood cancer at some point during their life. It's often late in life. Um, and obviously you're quite young. Um, so some children will get different types as well. But as you say, there are so many subtypes. There's over 100 different types of blood cancer. And, and they start off by looking, is it lymphoma or is it leukaemia? We spoke to Elle the other day, hers was more of a lymphoma, yours is a leukemia, then it's is it acute or is it chronic? And so for people watching um, who've got a more chronic, they might be a bit like, well, why did they tell her to come to hospital? And, and this is because, of course, it's a much kind of more aggressive thing, isn't it? And suddenly you're being told, you're not being told, okay, we can just hang around. You're being told we need to get on and treat. So how was that for you? Because I guess it's a very different experience than it would be for me where I was told, yeah, we're not going to do anything about it for a while. Whereas you were told, come to hospital, stay in hospital while we get this. Yeah. And then yeah, and did you start I mean, even in that admission or how did it work? Yeah. So I went, I went to A&E on the Friday night. Um, I had the foresight because it was already quite late in the evening. I had the foresight to take a toothbrush because I thought, I might just be in the waiting room well, a really long time. The bleeding gums. No, it was. I didn't take the electric toothbrush, <laughs> thankfully. Um, I went to AE on that Friday night. Um, yeah, I was admitted straight away. They wouldn't let me out. Um, and that must have been a huge I was, shock, surely. As a yeah, I didn't go home for five weeks. Um, wow. Yeah. yeah. I mean, luckily, at that point, it wasn't locked down. So my husband was able to come home and get me a suitcase of stuff. But yeah, and, and I'd never spent a night in hospital in my whole life mm. up until that night. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was just, it, it's very difficult to put the kind of set of emotions that you go through in that situation into words, to be honest. Um, mm. Mm. It, you know, you, there's kind of, you're just really shocked. There's a kind of weird numbness. Mm -hmm. um, you feel a I felt a bit like it was sort of happening to somebody else and then yet at the same time you just you just keep kind of doing the next thing that you need to do whatever that is you know whether it's okay I'm gonna you know order some breakfast or I'm going to like phone somebody and tell them about this or um you know whatever it is they need you just keep doing it and you, and you stop you immediately it's kind of like your world shrinks because for me, I'm someone who's, you know, always got loads of plans in the future. And I can tell you every date that's in my diary forever. And then all of a sudden it's like, no, you're just doing this. You're just staying here in this tiny little room until maybe hopefully we might make you better. Um, so it's, yeah, it's just like the whole world stops. And to what extent do they give, did they give you uh, a sort of sense of, of how serious this was or, you know, or, or what, what you were looking at I mean was it quite obvious to you immediately this was um, aggressive or acute or not really I, th I think in my head so the assumptions that I would have made based on my prior you know experience which was very limited of, of leukemia was that it would that it was a very serious illness um, I, I didn't really I didn't know before my own diagnosis that there were chronic forms of leukemia so actually in a way the what I've experienced is is closer to my 
kind of preconception of leukemia yeah. than perhaps if I had I been diagnosed with a chronic form. Um, yeah, I mean, I always push to know as much as possible. So, um, you know, I feel that my medical team were very sensitive to like, they're not going to like push loads of statistics on me if I didn't want to hear them. Um, yeah. But I wanted to know as much as possible. And I think, you know, my husband and I were quite, that was kind of like our way of getting as much control as we could of a, of a situation which ultimately was out of our control was to kind of do our research um, on, you know, from reputable sources to yeah. ask lots of questions, to really try and understand the, the science, the research, the, you know, everything is so cutting edge, like so much of any statistic they can give you, any treatment they can give you is, is really up to the minute, um, you know, they, they can't tell you, is this going to make you live another 20 years? Because most people who've had that treatment, they had it in the last five years because yeah. it's, everything is so recent. So it's changing, you know, isn't it? And that's, that's the case with almost all the blood cancers, actually. There are so many new treatments yeah. coming through. And, and, I, and, even, and as, as well as giving me that sense of control, I, I believe that doing as much research as I can has, has actually benefited me in the sense that I can have those kind of conversations with my doctors about like, okay, well you know what are we doing this or are we doing this and I don't think that yeah I, I I just think knowledge is is generally good um but saying that the the statistics with AML are still quite scary partly because they're based on historic information and partly because it's a, not a very nice disease for want of a um better phrase yeah no it's, it's... I, I, we're not allowed to swear on this uh no, no, on this no, video, no. are we? So I'm holding back. I'm holding back. I, I, I um, yeah. I, no, I found no. that swearing is something that has been quite therapeutic for me during my cancer experience. But hopefully, yeah, you won't sure. have to um, bleep no, anything no. out. Well, we might have a few kids watching, you know, because the, the AML happens with children and with old people, um, and with people who are your sort of age as well, doesn't it? But it's were you a bit? Did you feel a bit kind of caught between the two? Because most people talk about it being an old people's disease, and then a few kids, don't they? Yeah, um, I certainly associated leukemia with with childhood cancer. Although I I believe that's more um, ALL is is the the very common one in children. No, you're right. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are some with AML. So this there's, there's yeah. a kid called Nathaniel Nabina who um, recently um, had a stem cell transplant at Great Ormond Street, and we were involved in helping to sort of fundraise for him through the group and everything. Mm. And he had AML um, and seems to be doing yeah. really well at the moment. So yeah. it's, not... it's funny to when you talk about the age groups and whether I felt caught in the middle, because people do say, oh, you know, it's, a, it's isolating to be, a, you know, a younger adult with cancer or whatever. I just found the whole experience incredibly isolating full stop yeah. because of infection control and because I was you know in an isolation room for like I, I was in hospital for a hundred days within it within less than six months yeah. and you know that's just very isolating um in a way it made no difference to me that the other patients were older or younger because I just didn't get to, I didn't get to see them and I still haven't and and that's another reason why you know having a, a chance to do kind of online peer-to-peer -peer stuff has been really really useful for me because um you just you know you can't actually build any connections with the the very people who are going through the same experience as you because you're a danger to each other and you know you're all in airlocked rooms yeah um, and even so, the nurses, I guess, even back then, before COVID, presumably been coming in with masks and and they're very busy as well, aren't they? I mean, I, I don't know how you found that, but um, I'm, I'm assuming that, you know, they wouldn't necessarily have had as much time as you might have liked for them to be able to sort of support you. And yeah, and I mean, a little bit. I, I felt on the actually on haematology because I was in for for my initial chemo, I was in for five weeks. Um, and then I had two more rounds of chemo, each of which I was in for kind of 10 days. Um, I actually on that ward, you really they really do get to know you because you're in for such a long time. And that's probably something that's a little bit different um, for me than it would be for anyone who is treated as an outpatient, maybe with a different treatment regime. Um, so in that sense, you know, you, you do get a more personal relationship. And I really appreciated that. Um, but COVID has has made a big difference so pandemic started 
this is fast forwarding my story quite far, yeah. um, but pandemic started while I was in for my second long stay, which was when I had my stem cell transplant. Can I just um, ask, um, was there a period of time where you thought everything was okay and you wouldn't need the stem cell or was it always heading towards the stem cell or what, how did that happen? Sure. So I was, I was given a kind of borderline prognosis, I guess, based on my genetics. I had two mutations. Um, I had FLT3, which is known to be quite an aggressive mutation with like quite poor outcomes historically. Um, but there are a lot more targeted therapies coming up for that now, which is what I'm now on kind of post-transplant. Um, and I had another mutation I cannot even remember the name of, which had a slightly better prognosis. Um, uh, but they don't what they don't really understand is how these mutations work with each other. Oh, I so, see. That, yeah. so for me, they said, like, I think the idea was that if it had just been the flip three, I almost certainly would have gone to transplant. If I hadn't had that, then I almost certainly wouldn't have. The idea was that they could just get me, try and get me into remission. They said they would try and do four rounds of chemo and provided that I was in complete remission, I wouldn't have a transplant unless I relapsed. Um, unfortunately, what actually happened for me was that after the third round of chemo, um, they were waiting after each round I would wait have to wait for my blood counts to come back up again before they would start another round and after the third round my blood counts just didn't come up um, I was going to the day unit at the hospital three times a week and once or twice a week I was ending up having to have transfusions because my counts were so low and they just weren't recovering so essentially I had sort of bone marrow failure like the chemo had taken away the cancer I was in remission as far as they could tell but I just it had just taken everything out of my bone marrow and I just couldn't produce anything for myself. So actually, they decided at that point that I should have a transplant um, because they, you know, they didn't they didn't want to give me growth um, injections because they were concerned that that would potentially boost growth of cancer cells if there was anything still left. Um, but, you know, I, I, I couldn't just live in the day unit forever Live, mm. I was literally living on blood transplants but blood transfusions which is kind of mind-boggling to think about those few weeks where that was keeping me alive yeah so anyone watching you know thank you very much for making blood donations if that's what you're doing and you know blood really does make a difference and it's amazing how much blood is used by people with blood cancer um yeah. both in those acute situations but also ongoingly so one of the things yeah. that keeps me going is antibody replacement hundreds of people you know give their plasma so that I can have mm. antibodies and and obviously you know I don't know how many different people must have given blood for you for that time but it's, it's quite a thought isn't it that, that all those people it really is yeah really helping you basically yeah so every single one of them saves your life um which I kind of love um and I went into I went into my experience with uh uh, I'd, I'd got a few I'd done a few blood donations many many years ago yeah. um and uh, I'm, I'm in serious debt now because I won't be able to give blood again sadly <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> no they don't they won't want your blood unfortunately no they really don't want my blood anyhow um yeah so that was the point at which I got um sent to transplant luckily in the background kind of even though they'd been saying to me we hope you won't need a transplant they had been searching for a donor because that's what they do these wonderful um clinicians and charities and all of these um fantastic agencies that work together um i believe i never really heard exactly how it's all worked out but i believe that i didn't have a a, a good 100 percent match anywhere um, my sister had been tested and was um found to be a half match um which I was quite surprised then when they decided I needed a transplant that they said, yeah, we can actually use your sister as a donor. Um, so I ended up having a haplo identical transplant. Mm. So did that make much difference to the experience or? So I think it made a difference to my conditioning treatment, which is what you have immediately before the transplant. I know that most people who are going for transplant will have some sort of chemo um, in the initial weeks or days immediately before the transplant. So the idea is that you're kind of wiping out most of the old dodgy immune system and replacing it with a new one. Um, for me, I had a total body irradiation, which I believe is specifically in order to prepare for the, the half matched mm. cells because they're 
more likely to kind of create a little bit of an internal fight with your own cells. So they use the radiation to really, really wipe out literally everything. Um, they're aiming for what they call 100% chimerism, which means that um, your blood becomes 100% derived from your donor's stem cells rather than in some transplants you get, a, you know, they're aiming for, I don't know, 80 or 90% chimerism. I'm not sure the exact numbers. Um, but yeah, the, the radiation, I think, was the main difference. I don't think everybody has that. Um, although, obviously, I have that one experience. So you, you, you're never able to really compare it to what it might have been like because you, you're so sort of intensely stuck inside your own experience. Yeah. And tell me something. So, you know, with all of this activity, treatment, action, did you get much chance to really sort of reflect on it all and think about it or, or, or was it just all sort of like one thing after the other kind of thing a bit? Um, I, I did, I was quite reflective during it. I mean, it's, you know, on paper, it looks like a lot happened in that time, but actually there was a lot of sitting around waiting for stuff to happen. You know, it's happening inside your body, but it's not actually happening in your brain. Um, so yeah, yeah. there's a I lot mean, of waiting in hospital, isn't there? That's what people don't realize, well, even so when you're quite much well. waiting. Yeah. So you know, I did. I think my my outlet for reflection was was writing. I did quite a bit of blogging. Hmm. Um, I got a notebook and I wrote, you know, random reams of kind of rants and poetry and all sorts of other things that hopefully will never see the light of day, but were quite therapeutic at the time. Oh, you know, you never know. You should go back to that notebook. There might be some good stuff. Yeah, yeah. maybe. <laughs> um yeah so I did reflect but you know you're when you're, you're reflecting on it while it's happening and it's you can only let yourself reflect so much I mean I absolutely let myself cry and scream and swear and all of that but at the same time you've got to get up the next morning and well not necessarily get up but if you're going to the hematology day unit you have you know you've got to keep going and I I hate 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 the metaphor of cancer being a fight mm. but while you are there in treatment you've you've got to see a future you've got to imagine that the treatment is going to be successful or else you'll just never get out of bed um mm. so so yes there was reflection but i think you you shield yourself a little bit from mm. reflecting too heavily while it's happening to you because you know that you know you just got to carry on mm. so I suppose hope then is is a critical thing you would say yeah hope and I don't know for me I, I just feel that like hope is just inevitable I don't know if that's because of just the sort of person that I am or if it's just part of our kind of evolution that you know we no one does any no one will do anything if they just really were completely um you know resigned to negative outcomes I, I mean actually some of the things I found most helpful were people um like kind of wallowing with me in my in my sadness when that's how I felt I yeah hope is a good thing but I, I don't want to suggest that um like we should all have to be smiley and happy all the time and that that makes a difference because actually I think, you know, they call it toxic positivity, don't they? Yes. And I could, yeah. I did not like it when people tried to make me be smiley and happy and, you know, oh, it's going to be okay. And I think the, be the best companions that I found, and this is my, per just my personal experience of how I wanted to be with it, were people who would come and sit with me and go, oh God, this is a bit rubbish, isn't it? Rather than the ones, you I know. Saw you, I saw you stop yourself there. Yeah, I stopped myself. They used stronger words. Yeah. Um, you know, I had one or two nurses who would say things, really well-meaning things like, I just know that you're going to be okay. Mm. That, I, I, wasn't, that wasn't for me because they don't know. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> um, yeah. They could, I mean, if they say they hope that you're going to be okay or even that, you know, we've seen other people in your situation yeah. who have been okay or all sorts of things like that that can be useful. But when they say they know, yeah then you think oh god what else do you know because you're looking after me <laughs> yeah, exactly because they don't know do they and that's the problem it's the uncertainty and that's I think where the statistics are not so great I mean my own father was told at one point um, in his cancer journey because he had blood cancer as well um, that he had only a 30 percent chance that the next round of chemo would make any difference and the doctors actually said and so some people probably wouldn't bother 
But then he was like, well, if I don't do it, what's my chance then? He said, well, then you will die. So for him, I mean, fortunately for him, he went, well, 30% chance is better than a 0% chance. I'm going to take it. And of course he did fine. And so, you know, if you're one of the people, you know, when when the odds seem stacked against you, if you're one of the people that, that do well, well, who cares about the fact that the odds were stacked against you? But equally, if the odds are really in your favor, but unfortunately you're one of the people who do badly, well, the fact that you had a 90% chance everything was going to work and you were one of that unlucky 10%, it, it doesn't really help you, does it? Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, a, a really good friend actually said something very useful to me, kind of saying that, you know, statistics are about groups of people. There is no, you as an individual, there's no such thing as your chances or yes. your probability. For you, it will be what it will be. And obviously the, the treatments that you have can can change the course of that, but you know, there will be one, there will be one story. Um mm. and you know, you're not a you're not a statistic. So I think, yeah, there's a there's a point where it becomes a little bit unhealthy to worry about them too much or unhelpful, if not unhelpful. Yeah. yeah, no, I think you're right. And it's linked with that whole idea of the fighting thing. You mentioned just a little while ago that you didn't like the idea of the cancer as a fight, although I know it can feel like that a little bit um when you're in the middle of treatment even but even then like what what is it about the fight thing that you don't like because I know a lot of us don't like it but I'm interested in your views views on that I think for me so I lots and lots of really positive great happy people who fight their cancer like still don't have good outcomes you know and I, I hate I think every time we say that somebody is fighting their cancer really hard. I, I feel like that's quite insulting to people who, through absolutely no fault of their own, just have a worse time and have a worse outcome and, and don't survive. And and that's, you know, for me, that I just find that really difficult. It's, I don't want the pressure of it being about whether I fight or not, whether I get through this, because actually what it felt like to me was that I was just kind of surrendering my body to medicine. Yes, exactly. um, and so I actually found a bit, I found a metaphor that I like better a bit further down the line after reading lots and lots of different things. For me, I feel like it's saying that there is a fight going on inside and that you, that I am a battleground is that works for me, especially after having had the transplant and knowing that you've got these two sets of DNA, which, you know, essentially are fighting the the idea of the transplant is that the the donor dna um kind of defeats your own dna which is a little bit faulty um and i'm, I'm happy with that as a as a metaphor because i do feel like a battleground you know the poor old fields didn't have a choice that there was a load of soldiers trampling over them and i and i do feel <laughs> like that sometimes um yeah so I, I think you know some people like the fight the metaphor of being a fighter themselves but it's, it's not for me mm. no I think that's an uh, interesting way of looking at it um the idea of a sort of battleground and I remember thinking a bit like that because for me I had the opposite experience to you in a way that I was told you know I was very unwell when I was when I presented but with a pneumonia so I had an infection and so I knew my immune system was mucked up And then I was told that, you know, I didn't need treatment at first and I might not need treatment for quite a while. It turned out to be about 18 months. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I remember when I was finally told that it was time to start, you know, the treatment, my imagination was just the thought, I almost kind of personalized the cancer cells and I thought they don't know what's coming to them. But you're right, it was much more about, you know, here you are, nurse, please sort me out. I, 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 I didn't, yeah, I didn't do anything, you know, you just lie there, don't you? And you, you take the treatment and, and you take the side effects. And Yeah, I, I guess that one of the differences between our experiences is that because you have to wait so long, you have a long time to, to psych yourself up for it. So yeah. even if you maybe it happens and it doesn't feel like a fight, you maybe have that time to, to wonder whether you are going to have to be strong or, or do anything. Whereas for me, I was just like, oh, wow, this has really like messed up all of my plans <laughs> and I have no choice but to kind of let them do this stuff to me. And also because of, because, you know, I, I was I was feeling really unwell. I'd been feeling really unwell for a month or so at diagnosis. But when they said it was leukemia, a bit of me was like, really? Like, I, I don't feel, it doesn't feel like leukemia because because you just feel like something that dangerous should, you know, you shouldn't, you feel like you shouldn't be able to walk down the road if you've got something that's, 
so like that's potentially fatal um so just not yeah not kind of being able to re reconcile those things in my head was was quite difficult um and and I just had to you, you have to trust so much in in what you're being told which uh, for me the only way to do that was to just kind of let go of a lot of my usual kind of energy and and proactive like zest mm -hmm. for life really and I did just spend that month in hospital just like okay just do what you need to do I'm, I'm just gonna try my best to to chill out and, and not kind of be involved yeah it's like almost the opposite of fighting actually it's yeah, like kind of completely. a passivity really yeah being a patient yeah. and being patient I often say they call us patients because we have to learn to be patient isn't it yes a yeah absolutely waiting. waiting for blood counts to come up is one of the most tedious things I think I'll probably ever do and you know and because you know that you feel so awful until they do and then it makes you feel better um yeah the day after transplant when they finally came up was quite um that was a, a good day mm. so how has it been since so you know you 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 talked about that at the beginning a little bit that you know you had this all this intensity and then you come out and I guess you're sort of you're still kind of not quite sure what what the future's going to hold at that point and it must have been a, a weird transition for you coming out of hospital after the after that. Yeah, start. I mean, I, my whole experience has been just completely shaped by COVID as well, because I so I had my transplant on the day that the WHO declared the global pandemic. Good right. timing. Um, and basically my 12 weeks. So they tell you after a transplant that you should be very careful in terms of mixing with other people for about three months. And literally the government were sending out food parcels for those three months to vulnerable people. So I couldn't have timed it better in some ways. Um, but obviously those 12 weeks came to an end and it really still didn't feel safe to be out and about because of COVID. And it's been, I think, throughout this whole journey. Not sure I love that word either, but we'll go with it for now. Um, <laughs> I think throughout this whole journey, I have often thought, oh, I wonder what this part of my cancer experience would be like if it wasn't for COVID. And I'll, I'll just never know those things. Um, you know, the pace of life has been very much slower, um, even for the last year and a bit since my transplant um, than it would have been. And, you know, COVID has kind of given me permission for that in a way. Um, and, and I'll never know, you know, would I have recovered in a different way if the world had been different around me? Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been really difficult, but at the same time, I feel like I've been really lucky. Um, you know, I'm, I'm still in remission a year and a half later. Um, and, and lots of people have been going through all sorts of different things. So it feels like there's a kind of there is a sort of mutually understanding and supportive world out there um, that maybe there wouldn't have been had, you know, we're not been through this kind of collective experience. So it's, yeah, it's been strange. Um, but, and, and I just, you know, I feel like it's, it's not over yet. It's, mm -hmm. it's, I, I know that I'll be a hematology patient for the rest of my life. And I hope that I'll live a really long time, but yeah. there's, there's all these different things post, a transplant that particularly for me that like so many different things my consultants will say oh well because of because you had that total body radiation you know you need to look out for this and that and the other and you know I feel like there's a kind of timetable ahead of me of like checking for all these different things that might happen in my body and you know you can't I, I can't live my life being sort of really terrified about all those things all the time but I'll obviously always need to need to look out for stuff um and yeah i guess i always feel lucky to to be in good enough health to do to do stuff um because you know it could have been very very different yeah and i guess it's you know really good that your gp um sent you for that blood test and, and i guess yeah. it, you know, it's and that you realized that there was something wrong i mean it's a it's an interesting thought isn't it and and i guess there might be some people who are watching this who don't have blood cancer um, but maybe they're feeling a bit tired or maybe they're feeling a bit achy and they're now probably thinking oh my gosh i better go to the doctor and yeah it is worth going but i guess for most people it wouldn't be blood cancer would it so it's about going and getting it ruled out I mean, she yeah, didn't exactly. the blood cancer, did he? he? just said, I'm doing a blood test. No, exactly. And, and, and you know, actually the, 
my doctors, my consultants said, well, your GP did the only thing that she could have done because she probably, they, they said to me, she probably would never see another case of AML in someone, you know, under 65 in her whole career. They, they thought that it would be rare enough that that would be a once in a career thing wow. for the GP. So, you know, I couldn't have expected any more, um, but I'm just really glad that I, you know, I did go to the GP and that it was taken seriously with, you know, I think because I was told the first time it will, you know, come back in two weeks if you're not better, that was then back on me again to go back. And mm. I did that. And I'm so glad that I did that. And, and I think that is it. You have to, when some, when you're told that, that actually means something. They're not just fobbing you off. They're saying like, the average virus will go away in two weeks so therefore if this doesn't go away then we do need to investigate it and that's you know that's actually a kind of approved protocol that makes sense it's not yeah. a way of getting rid of you and, and I'm you know I'm very glad that I kind of took that seriously and went okay this is not getting better in fact it's getting worse I'm going back and yeah, yeah. So I think that's yeah. the message isn't it it's it's you know it's not panic stations I've got blood cancer it's okay, I'm not going to just ignore these symptoms. I'm not going to just pretend that they're not there or, you know, and be fobbed off, as you put it, like, or feel fobbed off, as you put it that way. And, and actually, you're right, you know, go back, go back to the doctor to say, look, you know, this is how I'm feeling. And if you get really ill, you know, you can even turn up at A&E and, and, and that's okay, you know, if, that's, if, if you feel that dreadful. Don't ignore it because sometimes you know you, you, you and it might not be blood cancer it might be something else of course um that, that you need to sort of address and I think people are sometimes a bit nervous of going to doctors um or bothering them you know and so they wait mm. till, till things get really bad and you know it is crucial isn't it because like I don't know what your doctor said but I'm, I'm guessing if you'd have left it another few weeks you know it might have been a different outcome yeah quite possibly I I, I actually really never had those conversations but you know chemo started for me within days so you know I can only ever be be glad that it happened that way around yeah no, I think that's right mm -hmm. so yeah I mean and now of course you're you're working um you're you know building a life for yourself post-transplant um I guess it's obviously still there for you you, you mentioned earlier it's never going to go away but yeah um, yeah it will uh, it will always be there. I mean, I'm not very, um, I don't get too sort of sentimental about silver linings because I think it totally changes your, mm. your direction of your life. And, you know, lots of people say that, that it's kind of forced them to reassess and discover new things, but I, I, I would never, I don't ever want to sit here and say that it was a, that it's been a good thing because <laughs> I just feel that's such a betrayal of that yeah moment where it was like the worst thing in the world um and I'm, I'm definitely not at that place yet um but you know I'm still here so yeah and I guess goes. that's the thing isn't it yeah. oh. sorry about that someone seems to be eager to get a hold of me so I don't know if that's a sign that I should let you go but you know I guess that's the point, isn't it? Life continues and and that's the difference and that's why we want people to be more aware of blood cancer and to be you know, more willing to sign up for those stem cell donors? Because, I mean, you didn't, you got a match from your family, but many people will get a stranger match as well, won't they? So that's another way yeah, and, to and save a, lives. You know, something to say about the, the transplant I had is that though the half matched is great and it means that more people can have sibling transplants, but they were only able to do that for me because I was fit and healthy and I was able to have the radiation. So they would typically not do that in a, in most older patients from what I know. Um, so, you know, they, we really still need stem cell donors so that they can try and find those hundred percent matches through um, unrelated donors um, because it's not, it's not an option, even though a lot of the world's population have siblings, it's not an option for everybody to, to have the kind of conditioning that is, is required for the half matched transplant. So I would hate for anyone to think that, you know, that's a reason to not yeah. kind of sign up because there's no good reason to not sign up. No, there isn't. You just, you know, go and get your swab done, basically, isn't it? And and then if someone gives you a match, you, you can save a life. I mean, there's, there's not many opportunities people have to save lives, but just giving blood or doing a swab um, can certainly do that, as we've, as we've explained. So thank you for putting a face to 
to blood cancer faced AML. Jenny, thanks for sharing your story so openly and honestly with us. Um, it's, it's been a real privilege to get to know you a little bit over the last, um, however long it is <laughs> since we met, um, and to just get to know you a bit more over this last hour. And um, I hope people watching find this encouraging and uh, inspiring and as, you know, um, yeah. That's it, really, I suppose. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. No, thanks, Jenny. And uh, all the best. And to you.